I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School. We're thrilled to have you with us. Um, and as I mentioned, and some of you would have heard yesterday, one of the wonderful things about this annual conference is that is how many of you have come from distant places, all kinds of organizations. There's several fellow deans of different public policy schools, Danny Qua, Alan Hirsch, Flavio Vasconcelos, you know, you're welcome to you all. There's, there's people from different governments around the world. One of the things that makes it possible is our partner, McKinsey's, who support the conference and make it possible for us to make it open and free. In other words, a place where people really can come, whether they're in a small NGO or a government department that doesn't have budget or, or whatever. And that makes this a very precious and quite a unique event to have this kind of conversation. And so I just say that because I'd like to invite David Fine, a senior partner at McKinsey's who's heading their work on the public sector globally, to make an introductory remark this morning. Thank you, David. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, Nairi said, if I keep this to 10 minutes, we can do a bit of a Q&A. So, if I'm rambling on, please point it out. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm a South African. Um, I'm not a natural uh, public sector athlete in the sense that I, I barely passed English. So, I'm, for people who know me and friends in the audience, I'm a pretty direct, a little bit less nuanced person. So, the points of view I'm just going to give are coming from that perspective, a little bit more direct, a little bit less nuanced, and based a little bit on, on what I'm seeing in the world, and, what, and that's what Nairi asked me to, to just bring across. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is a terrific gathering. I really think this is a very special gathering of people, thinkers and pr practitioners around the world. The partnership between McKinsey and Blavatnik is something that actually is very special to me. And I think the way in which you know, Nairi and Blavatnik has partnered with us has just been uh, really terrific. I know over the last couple of days you've seen a few McKinsey people in the room and just uh, maybe a, f a few um, reasons. I mean, we do support governments with a serious reform agenda. And we, we honestly believe that it's important to make substantial contributions to vital services, to helping people with the sustainable development goals and to ultimately changing people's lives. And that's what we do, that's in our DNA. Uh, if you speak to a lot of the recruits that we have, they actually want to make a difference to the world and help with some of the most complicated problems. And I personally believe there's never been a more important time to contribute, and I'll talk a little bit about that again. What I term, and we are terming in McKinsey, the great disequilibrium. This moment in time is very, very complicated. Um, it's not the easiest sector uh, to operate in, which I'm sure all of you have experienced in some way, multiple stakeholders, complex problems. Uh, the geopolitics at this time is very, very, very complicated. Um, you know, as a firm, uh, and you've also obviously seen that, we don't always get it right, we make mistakes, we don't have the thickest skin in the world, and, uh, you know, we have to put the right capabilities in place to be successful, but we honestly believe it's an important sector, it's an important place to contribute it, to contribute. Maybe just on this great disequilibrium, just a couple of the forces that, that we just see colliding. Um, and, 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 and I don't think that the world has seen this con collision of forces before. People talk about the Industrial Revolution. You know, we have this thing about the future of work. We have, which is a nice way of saying that lots of people are going to be displaced because of technology. The identity politics that's playing at the moment is just really, really concerning climate change, this idea of taxation, which has been based on thousands of years of labor taxation, when actually everything's moving away from labor into more capital. Um, you know, the issues of inequality, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the moment, and also in particular gender in inequality. You may have seen last week we published a report on that. Uh, huge issues. And citizen satisfaction. Citizens are dissatisfied with governments. And I'll give you a few facts in a moment. And so you add all these mixtures together and you just look at how these forces are coming together. Uh, it, it's just it's a very, very complex time. Um, the last thing which I'll just say is it's in the context, I don't know if people have seen 
what I am, am, am sort of recalling, because a friend of mine coined this, the 4951 paradigm. If you look around the world and you look at whether it's within parties or within many of these sort of democratic elections that have happened, you're getting this kind of 49-51 paradigm where the 51 wins everything and the 49 sort of loses everything. And, and you're getting massive polarization then happening because the winners are then appealing to, let me call it the core, is also contributing to a much more contracted environment where getting people to take these complex problems and getting them together to collectively solve them is actually, uh, the context is more complicated. So, so that's a, a bit of the problem. I'll spend a bit more on the problem. I will end with slightly more optimistic view. Um, just a couple of facts, perhaps, on, on inequality. Uh, we, we've, we did a consumer research, essentially, of 100,000 citizens around the world, uh, and we're going to publish that soon. Uh, one of the key issues that change in wealth is the most important driver of confidence for citizens. Change in wealth is the most important driver of confidence in the future. So this issue of inequality is not just an issue of, you know, some people getting more and some people getting less. It's un ultimately driving the underlying confidence that people have in the future. And particularly in that middle class, which you're seeing particularly in more Western economies, more developed economies, who have not benefited from the changes over this period of time and are the bedrock of political stability, the consequences are substantial. The second thing is 57% of citizens around the world, and this survey covered region which would be about two-thirds of the world's population, 57% of respondents are saying that governments are failing to deliver. 57%. And 41% are saying that they actually uh, are disengaging from the political process because their vote doesn't matter. So the underlying dynamic you know, has filtered down. It, you know, this idea that these are all meta issues is fully supported by the feeling that people have on the ground that actually there's a structural situation that actually needs resolution. So again, the disequilibrium, uh, and it has obviously a certain connotation from an academic perspective, and, uh, it, but it also has a perspective just in terms of, of the underlying factors. So maybe just to reframe things and, and move forward, uh, you know, at the same time, the solutions are out there. So let me give you a few examples. If I take energy, there is an idea of free energy, that energy is free. I mean, there's abundant energy, there's sunlight, there's waves, there's all kinds of things. The price of these technologies are falling. What does that actually mean, free energy in the context of climate change? Uh, from future of work being a threat to free time and what to do with free time, which was discussed, uh, you know, 200 years ago. What does this actually mean? Th these benefits that may come when we free up time and how do we actually deploy humanity against that? The idea of identity, which everyone is focusing on identity politics, but shifting that to community, how people feel a sense of community, part of a community, embraced, supported. What does that actually mean? Um, and when I travel around the world, I'm starting to see, you, you know, some wonderful, wonderful stories. Uh, I know that you heard yesterday about the e-baby. You, you know, this idea of digitizing citizen services, it's happening. Uh, it may not be happening fast enough, but there is, you know, there are lots of solutions out there. Um, a few places where I've been where I think there's just some really profound thinking. In Dubai, you know, Ministry of Happiness. You know, what does it actually mean to have citizens who truly feel, uh, you know, excited, productive, engaged? What does it actually look like? Uh, in New Zealand, the idea of actually looking at the balance sheet as a mechanism of the country to reframe how to think about fiscal management of an economy. You know, what is the opportunity in that, just given, you know, most countries are really in a tight spot. The German refugee story, which I know has been in the press a lot, but if you just take a million people and you apply good, you know, management practice to integrating those people into a community in a productive way, it's an amazing story. 
the evolving impact capital, you know, this idea that capitalism is completely disconnected from what many people in the room are doing, but the, just the evolution of impact capital and this idea that, because we're awash with capital, actually there's too much capital in the world in some ways, so how do you think about deploying capital and having impact on people's lives? Very, very interesting idea. But I think at the heart of it, and maybe that's why this group is just so important, um, you know, it's going to take people to come together from all the various sectors, public sector, private sector, civil society. And I think that's the challenge that we have. So maybe my calling and my, my sort of call to action from the group is, you know, how do you make sure that you're not just sitting here in a year's time saying we're having a great chat? What is it you're going to do between now and then to bring yourselves together, to bring these ideas that are all out there, to really build scale and to start making progress? And I think we have to make progress fast uh, to make a difference to this very contracted situation we're in, which is pregnant with opportunity, but also pregnant with, with danger. And so to call, use the Chinese phrase, I think it's Wei Ji, which is in crisis there's opportunity. I think this is the moment and this is the time. Thank you so much, David. And I took too long. I th no, that, that, was, that, that was excellent and thank you. And thank you for setting us off today with a positive note about some of the things that are going to change. Um, we're going to move straight now into hearing from a practitioner right at the coalface, I promised yesterday morning that we would not wallow in what's wrong with the world for two days. And we started yesterday with um, an inspiring account from the Prime Minister of Serbia. This morning, we have with us Jennifer Musizi. The, in 2011, Jennifer Musizi was appointed to be the first ever CEO of Kampala Capital City Authority, an experiment in governance. Let's take a capital city and transform it. I'm not gonna tell you what happened after that because she's right here to tell us herself. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's very um, impolite for us to start speaking without greeting the people. So good morning. Good uh, Naira has introduced me. I'll go ahead and introduce my dress. This is the traditional dress of Uganda. It's called Agomasi. My vision and mission to make it so popular and so famous that it is the dress of choice for your weddings in the UK. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and as you can see, Ugandans are already making a lot of progress in royal weddings. So next step, wardrobes. <laughs> in 2011, the government exhibited a lot of political um, goodwill and political initiative and passed a law to change the administration of Kampala City. The administration was a local government, typical uh, local government with uh, political leaders also being the executives. And for the last so many years, uh, about half a decade, the city degenerated in terms of service delivery, infrastructure, and everything you can think of. I think um, the KCCA, Kampala City Council then, was probably the worst run institution probably on Earth and on a few other planets. I, I could not imagine how government had let it operate in that state for so many years. My job was to turn it around to transform it, transform service delivery, basically do miracles after half a decade plus of dysfunctionality. So the law had to change and therefore created the position of executive director and a technical team to be the executive um, in charge of the capital city. We still have politicians, uh, but their work is mainly policy and um, oversight and ceremonial functions. Uh, which they don't want to accept, but that's the law. And um, we came in. We, I was appointed by His Excellency, the President of Uganda. So we came in uh, basically with nothing. There was no structure, there was no budget, there was no staff, there was basically nothing. 
I was the only employee of the organization for a full year without a salary, thank you very much, and a lot of challenges. But we started anyway because I wanted to be part of the transformation of our capital city. Everybody was embarrassed by its state and complaining and complaining, and here was an opportunity for me to make a contribution to improve our capital city. So I said, I'll see what I can do. So we put in place a new structure, new job roles, new job titles, a new pay structure, new vision, new mission, new strategic plan, and um, disengaged all the former staff which was a very interesting process, you know, disengaging over 500 people, no matter who they were related, connected to upwards, sideways, and wherever, we disengaged them and recruited afresh. Some of them came back, others did not come back because the whole setting had changed. We then hired very, very professional people, motivated people, people that wanted to be part of the transformation of the capital city. And the average age of our, our team was 31, 32, which was very unusual in public service, especially in Africa, where entry age is about 35. Um, so I had to convince the appointing authorities that it was okay to employ people below 30 because they had a vision, they had the energy, they had what I needed to do the difficult job of transforming the city. We applied best practices. Uh, big, best practice corporate systems in a government institution and began to see very, very uh, good results. We, we applied best practice in planning, in implementation, in assessment. We used non-conventional methods of doing our work. Uh, we, 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 we used modern methods of performance management and appraisals, uh, tooling, and all sorts of innovation. And the charge I gave to my staff, we have a city transform, go for it. If you have an innovation, let me know. I'll give you all the support you need. Just go for it. And they began to do amazing things. The revenue was mostly manual. We, we made it um, electronic in terms of assessment, collection, accounting. And in the first five years, we had grown the revenue by 186% and now reaching 200%. Which revenue we needed to fund the programs that we're doing in the city. We enhanced the motivation packages, of course, for staff, and uh, service delivery began improving the sanitation of the city, the services in the city, the health, the education. We have eight, 79 schools with over about 80,000 children in the school that we manage. We have prisons, we have markets, we have the transport sector, we have the public hospitals and everything under our docket. So, Public service, uh, service delivery started improving. We started building new infrastructure and um, automated a lot of the business processes which were manual, disengaged contractors who were not doing a good job and got new contractors. They didn't like me very much for it, but I got the results I wanted. And um, we put up principles of zero tolerance to corruption because corruption was the reason that the institution fell to the depth that it had. So we started dealing with corruption very, very firmly and sent a message across. Um, I, do always I always tell my staff, I will be with you on anything you do. I'll support you, I'll protect you, I'll be with you. But if you're implicated in corruption, you're on your own. So that is a message that they have all picked up. We also started engaging the public in uh, different strategic um, activities through effective communication, set up social media platforms. I think we have seven now. We set up radio programs, TV, media, community engagements, and so on. And the public started coming on board, coming from a position of suspicion. Does she know what she's doing? Is she half crazy? Why, why does she think she can do it? Eventually, they started buying in, and we started seeing the results. We started getting unqualified audit opinions, which had never happened. That means the Auditor General and all the auditors found nothing uh, hair-raising in our financial accountability. We also got a grade A credit ranking from the World Bank after studying our financial systems. We got um, highly satisfactory client, um, client satisfaction results from the surveys that we've been doing and um, started getting development support from everywhere. Because the institution had now gained credibility, so people wanted to deal with us. 
they knew we would account, they knew we had teams that would carry out the projects, and they started bringing in their support, both locally and internationally, and even individuals. I think KCCA is the only institution I know of government where private individuals, private companies in Uganda actually give money towards implementing government projects. That's a very big endorsement for us uh, in terms of the institutional credibility. We therefore reversed the uh, decline and started on a very, very strong upward trajectory uh, in the city. We have been recognized all over the world for the work that we're doing and even locally and in the region because people see Kampala as an example, as a template of transformation and it has become a benchmark for so many, uh, for so many. And um, you'd think it's, it's very um, exciting. Yes, it is very exciting, very energizing, very good for the people. But it has taken so much out of us. Uh, because you are dislodging interest, you are dislodging cartels, you are dislodging practices, it has also been a very, very high risk um, assignment. So um, you, 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 you come to acknowledge that people threatening to kill you is part of the job, and you're like, eh, you just, you know, just, it's, it's become part of the job. People will threaten to kill you, they'll attempt to kill you, they'll hurt staff, they will, they have poisoned staff, they have attacked staff on the streets to the point where all the management team has to move around with armed security all the time, including their residences. It's, it's, it's sort of weird when you think, I'm the good guy here. Why are they trying to kill me? I, when, I thought I was the good guy here. But that's the terrain in which we work when we're trying to put transformation in place. Because people that had access to resources and property in the city were being pushed out. We were reclaiming property that had been taken by all sorts of strange people, helped themselves to property buildings in the city, so we are claiming it back, taking them to court and being really, really firm with them, and they did not like that. The contractors were terminating, had worked in the institution for 20 plus years, doing a lousy job, we fired them, they didn't like it. So no wonder the threats were quite high. So we have to work through with many layers of security to make sure we can focus on the job. But sometimes the layers are, are not so, not where they should be. Like the day I found a, a strange man standing outside my bedroom door in the night. I was like, okay, yeah, where did you pass? But he had come in, so it's, it's that serious. Um, governance, governance, Policy, legislation, those are the areas in which, the parameters in which you operate to do what we do. And many times um, we have found challenges with policy makers, legislators, because the same people who make the policy and legislation are the same people who resist the implementation. So my thoughts are that before policy makers and legislators pass policies, I think maybe they need to do an impact assessment. <coughs> A risk assessment, what will the impact be and do we have the guts to take the impact? Because otherwise we impact people as implementers and then the policy makers and politicians do not like the impact. But we believe that what we're doing is good because it's based on the law. And if policies and laws and legislations are passed and handed over to implementers like us, expect us to use them. Sometimes you think, so why did you pass this law if you did not want us to implement it? But that is a challenge that we've always been uh, facing. And we've urged legislators, policymakers to support us as we implement uh, legislation. Because selective application of the law kills compliance. And many times they ask you, oh, this one is my relative or my friend or my partner. Please do not apply the same law. And we're saying either everybody complies or no one Will be, will be required to comply. Otherwise, it opens up the system to corruption, to bad practices, and those kinds of things. The, the, the political barriers that are thrown in the way many times frustrate the implementers 
and uh, disable us in doing our work. So the politicians have a role, and I know many of you may be working with politicians or are politicians, you have a very, very key role in uh, development at whatever level. Um, the other thing, I know that many of you may have been doing research, working with developing countries and so on, but one of the things that you have to come to face with is even the policies that we're using right now as developing countries. We're seeing um, laws and regulations handed down by the colonial masters, public service standing orders. There's something called public service standing orders. If you look in the history books, you'll find it. Well, we're still applying it in our countries. And you cannot use public service standing orders handed down 70, 80 years ago to the current situation with cyber crime and the, the, the e-commerce and fraud and all these things that come with the cyber age that we're working with. But those are things that impact on development in our countries and need to be reviewed and changed to meet the needs of, um, of the citizens and the countries that we, that we come from. Um, I also found that, or you may have also noticed, that when you go to deal with governments, I don't know how it is in, in the UK, but you find that the boards, um, the boards that handle and make decisions to do with public service, employment, appointments, and so on, are comprised of distinguished, retired gentlemen and ladies. Um, some of whom, if you come from where I come from, need their grandkids to help, to help them do basic things like set up an email account. Now, they're making decisions about the public service to address the issues of today. Those are the challenges that we face every day. Um, because we cannot respond to the modern day challenges or be competitive in development if we do not up our policies and legislation to meet the needs of, um, of today. We, one of the challenges I keep throwing out, why don't we, as developing countries, adopt the practices of the successful companies that we deal with today? If we're dealing with Bill and Melinda Gates to, to fund projects in Kampala, what are the practices that have made Bill and Melinda Gates so successful? Can we adopt those practices, say, for HR, for assessment uh, of performance, and so on? Why are we sticking to something that doesn't work? There have been reviews in public service, reviews after reviews after reviews, and I know some of you may have been part of those reviews and restructuring, but there's a fundamental defect with the policies many times that needs to be addressed before we can have a successful implementation and, 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 and transformation of public service and service, service delivery. We, as governments, I'm now speaking as a government employee, we have bigger budgets than a lot of private companies, but the budget is applied to things that do not directly translate into results and service delivery improvements, and that, that is an area that needs to be, needs to be reviewed. We also, um, as Africa, invest a lot of funds in training, equipping, skilling our people all over the world. There are Ugandans that come to great institutions like Oxford and Harvard and Yale and so on, uh, all over the world, and institutions in Uganda, and they come with qualities to enable us to change. But if the policymakers and politicians do not allow them to implement what they have learned, then we shall miss out on the investment that we've made in these people. Uh, they're able to analyze the situation because they understand the culture, the setting and everything, and they're able to come up with innovative solutions that will transform um, our countries. We have done it in KCCA, and I believe that template can work for any, any other country, any other institution uh, in the developing world today. We, we adopted the practices away from the main public service, but we are seeing great results. So why aren't these great results used as a basis for adopting the practices which have been homegrown in, in institutions like ours? Otherwise, we'll have a continuous flow of our talent to the West, which is already developed, where they have predictable, modern, and uh, uh, good up-to-date systems, whether of performance, assessment, reward, and so on. We also um, spend a lot of time coming to meetings like this and others, benchmarking and so on, 
um, African brothers and sisters, you know that. But we go home and we cannot implement what has gone wrong. Policy, politics, and us as the technical implementers need to review what we're doing. Otherwise, we'll spend time in this meeting, and then next year we'll be back, and then we'll go to a couple of other meetings before that, but we'll not see the results on the ground. We can transform Africa, but we can only do it if we are allowed to transform Africa. Um, and for you that are working with developing countries, these are things that you have to put in context because otherwise the investment you're making, the research you're doing, the efforts you're meeting, putting in place to try and address social economic development issues in Africa and other developing countries will not yield the expected results. Things like governance, corruption, um, and all those settings I've mentioned need to be addressed if our developing countries are going to move uh, from where they are today. And um, otherwise, they encumber, they frustrate, and they slow down development. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, two, weeks, two weeks ago, I resigned from my position as executive director of, of Kampala. And um, yes, handed my resignation to His Excellency, the President of Uganda. And um, the question is why? Why, when we're doing such a great job? I'll leave you with that thought, <laughs> that <laughs> we, <laughs> we as Africans have everything, everything we need, whether it's natural resources, brain capacity, energy, innovation, understanding the terrain, the vision, the ambition to transform Africa. But we can only transform it to the extent that our colleague Africans allow us to. Thank you very much. tantalizing ending. Um, we're certainly thinking in the school about um, case studies at the moment of several countries where what politicians need to do is different to what the technocrats need to do. And, um, and so Kampala Capital City Authority is going to be a useful case for us to look at and I'll, I'll say no more. Um, but I did want, just before we move to the next panel, to to turn to just for one quick sentence from each of two deans in the room to say, what is it that you think we need to learn from cases like this for the teaching missions of our schools? So there's several schools of government here, but Danny Quar is the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School. And Danny, what is it that either you want to know from the case or you would learn from it for teaching future leaders of, of, of Asia in your school? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for and commendations and congratulations on the wonderful work that you've done. One of the governments, you know, in terms of the, the anti-corruption drive, one of the governments in the world that's more set on fighting corruption is China. But China is doing it in such a way that it, it, in many Western eyes seem overly draconian. Now, you have been in the front line of having to manage power and how you deal with corruption. And I wonder where you think the right margin is for the trade-off between having too much power in continuing to combat corruption or ultimately being unable to continue that fight. Thank you, Danny. And I'm just gonna ask for a comment also from Alan Hirsch, who's um, heading the School of Public Policy at the University of Cape Town. So what, what do your students need to learn from this example? Well. Um, what, what I learned, and I don't know very much about the Kampala case. Well, first of all, I learned it's very good to have to be appointed by the president, 
Um, <laughs> I think having the president as your champion, having a, a senior politician as your ca champion is very important. But then at the same time, you've got local politicians to deal with. So you have to make sure that they have enough ribbons to cut and enough glory to gain out of your achievements as possible. So, you know, I think what I've learned is that, you know, with, with, with the kind of championship of the presidency, it's not enough. You have to make sure that you manage the local politicians. And maybe that has been an enormous strain. And I can understand that after seven or eight years, you, you must be pretty exhausted. Um, I also learned, first thing you did was fix the revenue base. Um, something that you know is absolutely fundamental cleaned out corruption and you and you talked about empowering managers and I think the, that the way that you empowered your managers you've got the right people in and you gave them authority um, is, is the way to get things going it's nothing is simple I'm sure you're absolutely exhausted but um, I'm sure we will I hope that you do prepare a case or we can share your case um, and teach it in, in years to come thank you thank you very much Jennifer, did you want to respond on corruption, just very briefly, and then we'll move to the next panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps uh, starting with the last question, there have been a number of um, studies, academic studies done on, on Kampala, uh, including PhD studies and others still ongoing. So there's already uh, a, a, quite a bit of material to start with if you're interested in, in what we've been doing. Um, balancing performance, um, development with politics at the different levels is, I, I, I haven't cracked that one yet. I haven't cracked that one yet because um, the, the politics in Africa is different from the politics in the West in many ways. And um, you would think for things like fighting corruption, depending on who you're impacting. You get support or you not get support, uh, depending. And that's a case with a lot of African countries. Uh, but the, and, and you'd think that when we implement development, uh, the development agenda and get all these services to the people that elect the politicians, you'd, you'd expect a lot of support from the politicians. Well, that is an assumption that is many times not the case. So that, that is something that I'm still, I think maybe also do a case study on the politicians and development in Africa one of these, these years. Um, on the question of corruption, uh, what we did in our organization was initially screen people coming in as much as we could, do, do due diligence, but also because they are younger, they were younger people, they, so many of them didn't have a history of, of corruption. Uh, so they came in young, fresh, and were able to tailor them to the needs of the organization, but also begin from the start. Many of them, this was their first job or second job. From the start, um, equip them, train them, motivate them, tell them the need to be people of integrity, and, and, and also put in place systems that remove the human, sec uh, the human involvement in, in a lot of our service delivery. If I'm assessing your taxes manually sitting at a desk and we're doing the calculations together, and then I'll sort of like tell you, oh, this is how much you're supposed to do, and then to pay, and then you, the negotiations begin, or I come to your house to negotiate what you're going to pay as property rate, that opens up corruption. So we removed a lot of the human element in our uh, systems, and therefore made it predictable. There's no cash. It's a cashless system. People pay by their mobile phones or on the internet. There are no bank queues. So you cut down a lot on the corruption. But also, it's not that we do not still have incidents of corruption. We do. But I think it is how, as leadership, you deal with the cases of corruption that you find that determines where you're going to go with it. If the leader compromises with corruption, depending on who is involved or for whatever reasons, or you fear the authorities or something, then you've lost the battle to corruption. But if you deal systematically with the cases that you find, that reduces very significantly the incidents, and the staff know that there's a very high risk, including members of the public who we arrest for trying to compromise our staff. They begin to know that there's a very high risk in corruption 
and the incidents go down. I wouldn't sort of hang people or put them on firing squad, but um, we, we are very firm when it comes to dealing with corruption. Yes. I like the reflective way you say you wouldn't necessarily. You know. <laughs> um, right, can we have a hand of applause for David Fine and for Jennifer Muzizi for opening us this morning? We're moving straight into the next panel. So can I invite you, while the panelists come up here, to stand up, stretch, and then introduce yourself to the people sitting on your left and right. You've got two minutes to get to know them. And people at the back, find seats. <laughs> 